Well, hello, everybody. I am excited to be popping on in here again today for our second live stream event. We are having a promotional kind of flash sale going on this week up until September 20, or September 1st, and I'm offering 30% off my one-on-one -on -one courses on attachment styles. And so what I've been doing over the past few days is a bit of a live stream event to tell you a little bit more about what is actually in these courses and what you can expect to receive, as well as bringing it back to some of the basics for those of you that are new to attachment. So for today, if you are someone who is sick of falling headlong into relationships only to wind up feeling kind of bored or smothered or terrified of hurting your partner just when things are supposed to be getting good, then this is the video that you are going to want to watch because I am going to explore four strengths of individuals with avoidant attachment, what I refer to as rolling stones. And so again, this video here is in promotion of a 30% off discount on my 101 courses, including anxious, avoidant, and disorganized attachment. And so today we are gonna be honing in on avoidant attachment. Um, and if you're ready to learn more about that, you can check it out in the links of this video below. Now, if you don't know me or you're new to this channel and or to my group, my name is Brianna McWilliam and I am an author, educator and licensed and board certified creative arts therapist. And I've had about 13 years in the field now. And so using a psycho-spiritual approach with creative arts interventions, I help individuals struggling with insecure attachment go from feeling confused and fearful to achieving what I call self-sovereignty and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for years on end with no tangible result. And I call my method the MAC method, and that stands for mastery, awareness, and creativity. And it is founded upon the principle that self-sovereignty evolves out of a continuous loop between conscious awareness and creative expression. And so this loop uses three practical tools to maintain its momentum. And the first is cognitive reframing. The second is body activation. And the third is arts-based experientials. And so today, we're going to hone in on some cognitive reframing by helping you to shift your conscious perspective regarding avoidant attachment. And at the end, I'm going to answer a few questions that may pop up along the way. So feel free to type those in um, as we go along. Now, I describe individuals who have avoidant attachment as rolling stones because the language that we often use in the attachment literature like avoidant for example can be kind of judgy and it can be a bit predictive of the outcome for that person and i think that that is irresponsible in a way and so i use the term rolling stones because i feel it is a gentler more affectionate term to use okay and i also find that it's a term that often individuals with avoidant attachment prefer so this condition of having avoidant attachment, what I'm going to refer to as a rolling stone attachment style, is a circumstance in which you may feel a great sense of strain, suffocation, confusion, or intrusion when it comes to deeply intimate relationships. And so there's also an underlying fear of abandonment or rejection, as well as fears of being weak or not worthy. And so for the Rolling Stone, there's an essential disconnect from and a distrust of what I'm going to call the true self, the essential self, the transcendental self, if you like. Those who are more psychologically minded might prefer to think of it as the unconscious self. Okay. And so this distrust has led to feeling insecure and avoidant of intimate situations that stimulate those fears of vulnerability and or of being smothered and taken over and over controlled by a partner. And so it can rear its head in adult romantic relationships, perhaps as a reliving of childhood wounds, um, particularly wounds that occurred amongst families where caretakers were either overly doting and emotionally controlling, invasive and or oppressive and lacking in personal boundaries. So sometimes this might be referred to as enmeshed family backgrounds or they may have belonged to a system in where there was a lot of dismissal or criticism of bids for contact and parents were more emotionally distant. Or they might've had a situation where there was a little bit of both 
And so the signals were confused. So this can be thought of as um, little t trauma or developmental trauma as first coined by Bessel van der Kolk, who's a trauma specialist in Boston. And in some instances, there may be more severe trauma also present in a Rolling Stones background. And that means there's severe abuse, neglect, abandonment, significant illness and things like that. So to just to sort of bullet this a bit more specifically, a Rolling Stone may struggle in the following ways. And that is, you may be accustomed to partners that demand too much of you. So you become sensitive to even benign requests. Okay. Um, you tend to view generosity as a form of emotional manipulation, that it is trying to obligate you to reciprocate more than you're actually comfort, comfortable giving. Um, you may anticipate being blamed for when things go wrong in a relationship. And so you kind of head it off by avoiding taking on too much responsibility or commitment to begin with. Um, you might be described as having a fear of commitment, but often that's only because you take commitment quite seriously. And when and if you do finally decide to commit to something, you want to make sure there are not the chains of obligation assigned to it, right? Commitment and obligation are not actually quite the same thing. Commitment is something that you choose of your own free will. It's something that you continue to do from a place of choice, as opposed to obligation, which is something you feel like you have to do, okay? Now, you might be considered aloof or emotionally distant, but when you do feel things, it's likely that you feel them very intensely, sometimes so much, in fact, that it could scare you. It might even be hard to identify the feeling, let alone express it articulately. So you may try your best to kind of shut it down before it overwhelms you. You may also struggle with perfectionism and a fear of failure, but perhaps you act just the opposite so as to avoid appearing too weak or vulnerable. Deep down, you might believe that you have to earn love and approval, and so you're drawn to partners who are edgy or challenging and that make you kind of work for it. Now, on the other hand, a partner, if they give their love too freely, then you find them too boring or too nice, and you kind of question your ability to make them happy. You tend to fall into relationships rather quickly. You Maybe you do have a level of dismissiveness around your emotions, but you also can be quite romantic when you want to be. And typically after about, let's say, three to six months, you may find that it's almost as if a light switch is inside of you and all you can focus on are the flaws in your partner in the relationship. And you start thinking about all the missed opportunities out there. And if your partner flirts with someone else or expresses a need for space to you, you feel more of a sense of relief at first, though it may be followed by a need to test them. You may also struggle with forms of addiction that could be drug abuse, alcohol abuse, food addictions, shopping addictions, hoarding, gaming, other, other types of, of compulsive addictions as well. But the hardest thing for a Rolling Stone, I would say, is that they usually attract partners who have insecure attachment styles as well. And so they fall into what's called the anxious avoidant trap more often than not. And that's a circumstance where you typically find yourself in partnership with someone that is emotionally dependent upon you. And that inevitably proves your sort of pessimistic perspective on love, which is that love comes at the cost of personal freedom. So if any of that sounds like you, I would love to, if you could just hit the like button or just type it in the chat box there. Yes, sounds like me. I can have a sense of who it is that's joining me here on the call and try to gear this discussion um, so that it re relates to you. So as a Rolling Stone, let's talk about the Rolling Stone in partnership specifically. So as a Rolling Stone, you might be attracted to individuals that admire you um, for the things that you value in yourself and others as well. So that could be a strong work ethic, analytical abilities, uh, high quality performance, a need to right wrongs, okay? But you might be particularly attracted to those that express these values in dimensions that are dissimilar to your own, and therefore it would allow you to experience those values more fully through your partner. So for example, the hardworking stockbroker is attracted to the hardworking artist. The analytical engineer is attracted to the analytical literature professor. The high performing surgeon is attracted to the naturopath with a successful business. The hard 
hard-nosed prosecutor is attracted to the animal rights activist who just doesn't back down, okay? So you may feel reserved in your emotional expression, maybe even believe that if you allow yourself to become overly emotional, you'll become weak or lose control of yourself. But paradoxically, however, you tend to find a wide emotional range, attractive and inspiring in your romantic partners. And you may even need your partners to be somewhat colorful or sparky in order to feel that special chemistry between you, right? And so the deeper and more intimate that your feelings become for this partner, the more out of control you might start to feel, okay? And it's also hard for you to feel confident in accurately labeling your feelings and verbally expressing them out loud. So you start to increasingly feel anxious and smothered and need to put distance between you and your partner to make that go away, okay? And again, this may turn into finding fault with your partner for every little thing while downplaying and dismissing what feelings you do have for them. Or it could look like idealizing and romanticizing your partner as somehow morally superior to you. And so then you struggle to understand how you could possibly make them happy or deserve them. Okay. And so you start questioning, well, what is love anyway? How would I know if I even felt it? and then struggle to see yourself really living up to the task of a healthy relationship. And so in turn, your partner only becomes more needy of reassurance, and they start behaving in a way that is overly controlling and manipulative in a desperate attempt to re-engage you. And of course, that only exacerbates your desperate need to walk away even faster, even if you do still have feelings for them. And so alternatively, almost like overnight, your amorous feelings kind of turn off and you don't really dig too deeply into it. You assume it must be because of a flaw in your partner or somehow the chemistry is just off, okay? So it might sound something like this. A partner says, I think I'm falling in love with you. And you think to yourself, Ooh, you are gonna be disappointed. Partner says, I wish we could spend more time together. And then you find yourself thinking, don't you wanna give me a chance to miss you? Partner might say, so-and-so was flirting with me. Does it make you jealous? And you might think, oh, what a relief, someone else to take the pressure off. Okay. Um, partner might say, are we going to make things exclusive? I really need to know if this is going somewhere. And you're probably feeling, oh, I'm feeling really smothered like right now, and I would rather keep my options open. Okay. So this is an examination of the experience of the Rolling Stone. And again, if any of this sounds like you, please give me a thumbs up. Maybe even if this sounds like a partner you might have had at one point, give me a thumbs up so I know um, I'm on track here with this. Now, I like to emphasize the strengths of every attachment style, okay? Because I think we have a tendency to fall into negative cyclical thinking, automatic negative thoughts. And when we do that, we really cut off the possibilities for ourselves and for our partners. So I wanna emphasize the strengths here for the rolling stone. And so while a lot of what we discuss is kind of like the problem that avoidance can create in relationships, there really are tremendous skills and abilities that evolve as a result of this type of insecure attachment style. And so today I wanna to talk about four of them. So the first one is a strong work ethic. I have noticed that Rolling Stones often know how to get the job done, and they are not shy about rolling up their sleeves when it comes to something with a clear problem and solution. When put to the task, Rolling Stones tend to tackle a problem and they complete it with conviction. A Rolling Stone is also likely someone who believes if you want something done right, you gotta do it yourself and they feel really good about themselves when they have successfully completed something. Now, again, sometimes our greatest strengths can also be our greatest weaknesses, however. And so a rolling stone may fall into workaholism as a way of avoiding their emotional needs, or they might struggle to delegate and wind up feeling kind of burned out and or sabotaging their own success. Okay. Now, the second strength would be analytical problem solving. So rolling stones are often methodical and analytical in their approach to all things. They tend to derive a strong sense of self-esteem and efficacy from their ability to intellectualize and to be rational without letting their emotions get the better of them. 
And so they may even be relied upon for this and can be great thinkers and conceptual problem solvers. And because of this, they might appear to be calm and even keeled. It also creates the appearance that a rolling stone doesn't take things too personally often. And so friends might describe them as really good listeners. Now on the shadow side of this, however, all that analysis can sometimes leave them with a lot of energy in their heads, spinning their wheels, trying to think their way out of something when it, be, it would be far better to feel their way through it instead. And so additionally, the overanalysis and emphasis on methodology can leave them in this kind of chronic fix it mode, which might involve some compulsive tendencies. And lastly, sometimes the calmness and not taking things too personally can actually come across to folks as evidence of not caring or being too aloof, let's say. Now, the third strength here is they are really good in a crisis, okay? Perhaps because of their ability to analyze and problem solve, Rolling Stones are also often really good in crisis situations. Imagine the emergency room doctor who has to turn off their feelings so that they can take quick and decisive action avoiding emotional paralysis, okay? They might even be drawn into high risk or thrilling careers because they may get a rush from the adrenaline as a form of acceptable emotional stimulation. Or they might enjoy a high profile position and derive a sense of personal value from their material successes and professional acknowledgement. Now, on the other hand, this inner compulsion towards being performance driven could also be so powerful that it scares them, in which case they lock it down. And, in and instead, they might appear lazy or apathetic, kind of shying away from challenging work or tasks that carry a high degree of responsibility assigned to them. And so a painful, if cleverly disguised, streak of perfectionism might actually paralyze them from taking real risks for the fear of failing miserably under that high pressure and incurring shameful feelings about it. Okay. Now, the fourth strength is they are often champions of the underdog. Now, while often appearing kind of aloof in intimate situations, a lot of Rolling Stones might also believe in the greater good and have a soft spot for animals and or people in need. And this could be just a secondary characteristic and express itself more privately, or it could motivate them so much that they become defenders and organizers of any group that they perceive to be an underdog. So in some ways, this actually keeps people at a distance because even though the Rolling Stone may be acting on someone's behalf, it's in a larger group rather than in an intimate one-to-one -one situation, such as in a romantic relationship. And so this creates a respectable and acceptable kind of shield that satisfies some social and emotional needs while hiding a deeper inner turmoil, which perhaps is only vaguely acknowledged. And so this shield or mask is kind of like an interface that makes it easier to interact with others and prevents things in the Rolling Stone social life from becoming too complicated. Right. This also tends to make Rolling Stones kind of irresistible to open hearts who are drawn to the Rolling Stones strength, independent attitude and charisma, and they desire to fulfill the Rolling Stones emotional needs. OK, so those are four strengths for the Rolling Stone. And let's see, I want to just take an opportunity to respond to what we've got going on in the feed here. We have. Um, Jocelyn, welcome. Thank you for joining me. We have Tiffany. Oh, I'm glad that's hitting the nail on the head for you. We have Amada Ali. This topic is so interesting. Why exact? What exactly is the difference between a narcissist and avoiding an avoidance? Okay, so I have a video I've already created addressing that very specific subject. Um, so after this is over, I will comment with a link in the caption that will lead you to that video. Um, my girlfriend is avoidant and I love her like crazy, but I'm so close to giving up and walking away. Mm. Sounds like the anxious avoidant trap. Um, feeling like they can relate. Helena feels like she can relate. Diane can relate. Rebecca, um, love comes at the cost of personal freedom. A lot of people experience that. My wife is the avoidant and I'm anxious. Mm -hmm. My guy's a rolling stone. Definitely sounds like my ex. You're on track. Excellent. Um, 
you and they are either all in or not really in it at all. Yes. So when we experience insecure attachment, oftentimes we experience our boundaries as all up or all down. So there's these extremes that we experience. I'm all in or I'm all out, right? There's no gray area. Um, feeling like it's on the nose, been going through this for a year, like he's so dismissive, cold and not caring. I'm dying of sadness today. Sorry to hear that. Feeling like it's true. I just gave my wife, my wife more space than asked than she asked for and she comes around, right? Sounds like me and my ex-girlfriend, right? So, so this is also brings up a very great point, which is that sometimes when you are feeling like when you are at the this place where you're like, I'm I'm going crazy, I'm going to give up and walk away, you've got a lot of momentum tied up in it. Okay, and you've got a lot of uh, you've got a, you're usually operating under a lot of false premises that you need that person to change in order for you to be happy, and and so there's a premise there which is that it's all up to your partner to fix themselves, to fix this relationship, to be what you need and want them to be in order for you to be happy, and that's a tremendous amount of responsibility, and so like what was mentioned later down in this feed here is when you can start stepping into creating a life that you are on fire about for yourself, when, when you find that whatever is going on in your life and whatever your passions and your interests are, are as engaging and engrossing and fulfilling to you as being in relationship to this person. And you can start to redirect some of all that momentum towards these, these pursuits that you have going on for yourself then the other person is going to feel like, oh, it's not all on me. It's safe to be in this relationship. And I'm not feeling locked in a corner anymore. Okay. Like that's a Rolling Stone's perspective. And so as it was mentioned here, when I started giving my Rolling Stone even more space than they asked for, then they started to feel like they could come towards me. And this is the result of what I think of as emotional crowding. So when you're an anxious person and an open heart and you're spinning around like this and you're like, I need all this. I need reassurance. I need them to do this. I need them to do that. Otherwise, I can't feel secure and safe within myself. You're creating all this momentum and you're filling up the space. Your, your energy and your boundaries are going like this. And the Rolling Stone's going to feel like, oh, right? And you're just, you're like, oh, all over. And they're going to, they're going to close up. They're going to clam up. Okay. And, and it's going to drive you crazy. Cause then you're going to think, well, I'm just going to try harder. I'm going to give them ultimatums. I'm going to withdraw and see how they like that. You know, and you're, you're trying all these methods. I'm going to hurt myself and make them feel bad about it. Right. You're trying all these different mechanisms to, to get, try to get them to do what you want them to do. And it's a preoccupation with control because you don't believe that in and of yourself you are good enough and that you will be fine and that if you can allow yourself to know yourself well enough to have passions and pursuits outside of being in relationship to this person that it's okay to allow those things to move through you to allow that person to move through you that um that you will be fine no matter what you will be on fire about life no matter what because whatever's going on in your life is as interesting to you as whatever's going on in somebody else's life right so, but it takes time. It takes time. And you can't force yourself not to think about someone because whether you are pushing or pulling against something, you are adding more momentum to that thing. So you just got to let it run. You just got to let it run, but you got to start blazing a new trail, a new path in a direction of something that you like and that is completely for yourself. That is completely something that um, makes you feel fulfilled and brings you joy. And as you start doing that, this is going to start picking up more momentum. And then this, it will start getting more and more and more. It'll get better and better and better for you. And all of a sudden, all the energy you had tied up over here is going to start moving over here. And be like, oh, that's more interesting. That feels better. That's something that actually takes me in a direction that I'm enjoying, as opposed to hanging out here where I feel miserable and beating myself up for not being good enough. Do, 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 do. And here you are. And now for the Rolling Stone, once you're able to start doing this, now they're like, your sort of assertion of, of self-sovereignty and your you creating that definitive um, self, having that self-definition is going to attract the Rolling Stone back because they're just like, oh, whew, whew. Now, I, now it's not all on me because there's no way I could ever live up to all of that, right? So the irony is sometimes it will call them back in the sense that you're not emotionally crowding them out anymore. You're actually creating space for them now. It's kind of like I've used this metaphor before where 
Um, it's like a lot of times uh, the anxious open hearts kind of want to crack their partners open like a nut. They want to they want to plant that seed and they kind of pull at the roots and they pull at the buds to get it to grow faster. Where a rolling stone truly takes, they're like a fine wine. <laughs> a rolling stone is like a fine wine. You got to let that 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 relationship grow and age over time. It gets better with time. You got to give it time and 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 allow it to be the sun, like be the sun and then in the water, in the soil and create that safe space in the relationship so that the rolling stone can bloom into it. OK, this is the, this is what the rolling stone needs. And if you come at them like this and you give them ultimatums and you invade their space and you stalk them, OK, they are going to feel assaulted. And it's, it's, it's in, in some way, it's called, I think of it as emotional crowding, which is a gentler way of thinking it. And an, an avoidant rolling stone is going to feel assaulted, really. And they know you don't mean to. No one's saying you mean to do that or you mean to make them feel that way. But that's how they're going to feel. Okay. Um, okay. So there were a couple of other questions that have popped up since uh, the live stream from yesterday. And I want to make sure that I address them here. So there was a question here um, about what what exactly does this program entail? So for so for the avoidant attachment 101 course, which is what I am emphasizing here today, we talk about the definition of avoidant attachment. We talk about the five ways that Rolling Stones keep love at bay. We talk about um, four essential emotional boundaries that take the Rolling Stone from confused to clear about that line between personal boundaries and conditions of love, which I talk a lot about here on this channel. Um, we talk about two types of avoidant attachment and how to know which one you have, which is fearful avoidance versus dismissive avoidance. Um, and, and it's important, it's a bit of an, an important distinction because each one is going to require a slightly different approach, okay? We also talk about three reasons why therapy often does not work for rolling stones and what you need to look for in a therapist who's going to be more successful with a rolling stone. Okay. We also do a seven step focus wheel and guided visualization to transform the fundamental fears of a rolling stone um, and help them step into a place of loving self acceptance. So, all together, that's a 60 plus page downloadable workbook with activities, templates, and assignments. Um, we also have more than 12 downloadable audio lectures, video tutorials, a guided meditation. You have lifetime access to all these materials and also access to the live QA inside my private Facebook group. Now, another question I got was, okay, but are, are these courses, is this course going to actually help me fix my problem? Okay. Now, most people search for quick fixes or easy solutions to change their partner's behavior, and then they feel frustrated when they wind up in those same old situations. But really, the liberating truth is that this one common denominator throughout all of your relationships is you. And so... This course is really intended to guide you on a journey of self-discovery and to help you learn how to be good at just being you, whether you are single or partnered, how to move fluidly in and out of relationships as is necessary, and how to access a deep sense of connection and relevancy, even when you feel like you are all alone. And so the purpose of this course is not to offer you tips and tricks on how to manipulate your partner's behavior in order to get some kind of result or outcome that you're looking for, but rather to help you feel more self-sovereign so you can have a deep and abiding faith that you are going to thrive no matter what happens in the uncontrollable circumstances around you. Because as much as those tips and tricks might help you in the short term, in the long term, let's be honest. Shit happens, and circumstances are always changing, as are you, as is your partner, as does your environment, and as does your relationship. And so this course teaches you how to ride that wave, how to be on fire about life, and still able to milk it for all the pleasure that it has to offer you. So more plainly, self-sovereignty is this ability to be a rubber band 
to be able to expand fully into your circumference so as to hold all that you need to and then return to a comfortable shape until you are called upon to expand again. And then eventually you might find that your basic shape stretches and enlarges to hold a lot more than you ever could originally. And so over time, your capacity for the contrast and the conflict of life grows. Okay. So another question was, well, what tools and techniques are involved with this? So I use a psycho-spiritual approach with creative arts interventions, and I help individuals struggling with these insecure attachment styles go from confused and fearful to achieving what I just described as self-sovereignty and calling in those soul-shaking, passionate partnerships they want. And that's without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible result. And I call this approach the MAC method. So the MAC method stands for mastery, awareness, and creativity, and it's founded upon this principle that self-sovereignty evolves out of a continuous loop between conscious awareness and creative expression. And so that loop uses three practical tools to maintain that momentum, and it is cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experientials. And so you will have these materials for a lifetime. Okay, if you do purchase the course, and again, it's available today at 30% off until September 1st, you have lifetime access to it. You also have lifetime access to any updates I might make to the course, and I do make them. I released these courses last year, and I've already added all together 22 new videos to them over the course of the past 12 months. I just added nine new videos to the Disorganized uh, Attachment 101 course yesterday. And the week before that, I added at least eight more videos to the Anxious Attachment 101 course. And I added a bonus course to that one altogether. So I'm always updating the material. Um, how do I know if this course is for me? How do you know if this course is for you? Well, particularly we're, we're emphasizing avoidant attachment today. So if you are ready, to stop getting stuck in insightful circles, right? You know what your problem is. You know what your problem is, yet nothing seems to make you feel any differently. So if you're ready to get out of that quicksand, right? And you want to step into a life that lets you feel your way through it rather than try and think your way around it, then you are ready for a course like this. If you are ready to release any dismissal of your felt experiences and be lit on fire, just light your heart on fire with an exuberance for life that will always help you survive the fleeting circumstances of whatever your current conditions might be, then you're ready for this course. If you are ready to recover your childlike self and delve into your creativity and move beyond conditions of love in relationship to yourself and in relationship to your partners, then this is the course for you. If you are a self-starter and you're interested in material that you can learn and digest at your own pace while receiving support inside our private Facebook group and during our monthly live streams, then this is a course for you. Now, if you are looking for surface level behavioral tips and tricks, text sample text messages and things like that to manipulate a partner into feeling and or responding in a certain way because you want to gratify your own unexamined needs or ego, then this course is not for you. It's just not, it's not, it's not, those are not the people that I'm also interested in working with. Okay. So if you're busy, how long does it take? I've, I've created these courses to be consumed within five days. However, when you enroll in a course, you have access to all lesson modules all at once. So you can go faster or slower depending on what pace works well for you. And I do recommend that you do what works well for you. And of course, if you change your mind, there is a 14 day money back guarantee. Just let me know that it's not what you were expecting and we will refund your money. No questions asked so long as you request that refund within 14 days. So again, these courses are 30% off today. It's going to end on September 1st. So there's links to that in the caption of this video. Feel free to dive in there and take a look at it. Um, and yeah, I hope that you've enjoyed today's live stream. I'm going to come back tomorrow and we're going to talk about dun, 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 anxious attachment one-on-one. Um, and anxious attachment one-on-one, I recommend you join me. It's going to be in the afternoon, probably between two and three tomorrow afternoon. 
That course is probably at this time, um, a, it, it's a very robust course because the majority of my audience tends to be anxious. So tomorrow will be, my cat's anxious too. So she's joining in the conversation here. <laughs> um, it tends to be probably, that has the most, let's say, creative and arts-based experiential directives in that course. And tomorrow I was thinking just to switch things up a little bit, we've been working on cognitive reframing yesterday and today, let's do some arts-based experientials and give you a taste of the MAC method with body activation and arts-based experientials. So tomorrow, if you wanna come back and join me, we're gonna work on anxious attachment and we're gonna bring it into the body and we're gonna explore our creativity together. So I hope that you enjoyed this and I look forward to seeing your comments.